stunned the world of classical music. Last summer, one of their brightest stars arrested for breaking into a motel. A desperate act, the consequence of drug addiction. Tonight, in a 2020 exclusive, violinist Eugene Fodor tells his story for the first time. How his journey from child prodigy to internationally acclaimed violinist was sidetracked by cocaine. And if you listen closely to his story, you'll see how drug addiction can snare anyone. Mm -hmm. And it raises the question of why would someone with his talent come to need a terrible crutch like cocaine? As a child prodigy, Eugene Fodor had reason to dream the greatest dreams. He had the gift and the discipline, it was all there. And early on, he delivered. So if he had it all, how did he get hooked? Tonight, he tells Bob Brown about a life the public never saw, but that turned Eugene Fodor's highest highs into his lowest lows. <laughs> The weekend before Thanksgiving in Phoenix, Arizona, conductor Teo Alcantara, Eugene Fodor prepared to play his first major symphony concert since his arrest in New England following a devastating slide into drug addiction. In the classical music world, where experts say the demands on performers are so strict and their dedication so complete that drug addiction is comparatively rare, Fodor's arrest came as a deep shock. Because Phoenix is named for the mythical bird that rose from its own ashes, Fodor hoped these appearances would symbolize a rebirth of his career. He featured a colorful, melodic violin concerto titled Symphony Espanol. During the time this 39-year-old virtuoso spent in drug rehabilitation at Conifer Park in upstate New York, the center had demanded that, in order to focus only on himself, he also give up his violin. It is an instrument he had begged for as a child in Turkey Creek, Colorado, after hearing his older brother learn to play. I was mesmerized by the sound of it. It, it seemed to uh, capture all the... the uh, beauty of song in nature's animals in one little box and uh, I couldn't leave during it and I remember um, I would always be around when my brother practiced so my parents uh, uh, put him in a bedroom with the door closed and wouldn't let me go in because I guess I got on his nerves after a while. I didn't think Gene had it in him because he had too many other outside activities that he was interested in. He was a roughneck and uh that's why we hesitated to give him the violin in the first place, but he just begged and begged. And he just took to that violin like nothing. With his brother, who became a symphony violinist and teacher, and often impressing celebrities such as Jack Benny, Fodor made concert appearances throughout the West after his professional debut at the age of 10. He practiced and toured under the strict eye of his father. Lots of times we we traveled by car all night long, especially after the concert, to come home so he could go to school. I was very focused in my art and learning the violin. It created a very singular existence for me. So I never really felt I was in touch with my friends in school. No, I, I could hang out with them only for a little while as I was watching the clock because I knew I had to get home, get two hours of practicing in at least before dinner to after dinner, so I didn't go on on dates. Fodor had his first conflict over drugs after being sent to study music as a teenager at New York's Juilliard School. It was a conflict that even then led to a treatment program. I was obsessive and compulsive about, about life in general, you know. Um, I think uh, it can be a blessing in, in that it allowed me to master the instrument of the violin, but uh, it can also be a problem when it, when it comes to sensations. And um, I discovered the sensation of marijuana uh, when I was 17, and um, LSD. Um, and um, what did your parents do about it? Well, um, did they seek treatment for you? Yeah, uh -huh, but it wasn't the kind of treatment that's available today. 
There was no counseling. Uh, there was just a psychiatrist that I saw like once every other day. The rest of the time, I just all we did was play rock and roll records and and it'd go outside and smoke marijuana. It was just it was uh, not the kind of recovery that uh, uh, had any any in- impact. <laughs> After that episode, Fodor went on to play in and win prestigious competitions for young artists. But the one that made him a national celebrity in this country was Russia's Tchaikovsky competition in 1974, the same event that had catapulted pianist Van Cliburn to fame 16 years earlier. In Moscow, at the age of 24, Fodor was awarded the violin competition's silver medal. The top honor that year because no first prize was given. Back home, it was as good as a win, and it helped launch a major concert career. There simply wasn't any limit to his promise. The concert pianist who often accompanied Fodor and has known him for more than 20 years, Judith Olson. He loves music and he loves the instrument. And with the kind of equipment and intellect that he possesses, uh, there is simply no reason why he could not do anything at all that he wants to with that violin. But because of his Western roots, there was also the pop celebrity image of Fodor as a rugged, handsome virtuoso on horseback from Colorado. That was an image that worked against him in the classical music establishment, even as it worked for him with fans and led to regular no, television appearances. Next time you do a concert, maybe you could buy Mr. Euchre's jacket. That would be kind of nice. <laughs> that was great. That was unbelievable. Do you see a nice con- concert at Carnegie Hall walking yeah. out in that and uh, well, with, with a violin? The price of admission for me to talk to you is to play. Oh, yeah, uh, people, actresses all from all over the country that uh, followed him from one city to the other. His fan mail was just by the hundreds, you know, and it was and phone calls, and it was really quite a, a siege. <laughs> At this summit of world leaders in 1983 and throughout his performance schedule, Fodor featured works by Niccolò Paganini, a 19th century composer and performer who was said to have made a pact with the devil in order to master such difficult, flashy pieces. This incredible technique was and is Fodor's great strength. But his reliance on it, at the expense of showcasing works with more musical depth by composers such as Beethoven and Brahms, was also viewed by many as his main weakness. Critics said he wasn't using his gifts by growing as a musician. In 1978, Fodor married. His wife, Susan Davis, traveled extensively with him, and they had three children before the breakup of their marriage in 1984. During that same period, the attention his career was receiving had diminished, and friends said he was sometimes depressed by it. Then, early in 1989, came his worst plunge into cocaine addiction, the episodes of drug abuse that would lead to his arrest. I don't know, something didn't seem right. Nothing I could really lay my hands on. He had lost some weight, and of course, the mother is always concerned about her children. What was really happening? Well, what was really happening is that... uh my cocaine use escalated, and um, I'm at a point in life uh, and have played the violin so much and, and love the instrument to such a high degree that uh, I was getting by with not as much practice as I normally did. And Were you ever afraid during that time that something might happen, that you knew the wrong kind of people, that they knew you and where you lived? No, I, I used to obtain the cocaine from someone who was very reliable and who I trusted and it uh, it had no strange substances in it like angel dust or anything like that it was it uh, you know it was very pure and uh, did you ever turn it around and sell it to anybody else never and I was offered uh, cocaine frequently uh, by friends who are wealthy in uh, lower Manhattan and so, no, I didn't have to buy it, and it's very prevalent. But he couldn't control it, and that was frighteningly apparent on the day of the last concert he played before his arrest. 
when from the Upper West Side of New York City, he was to drive to Killington, Vermont with his accompanist, Judith Olson. He was very upset because his girlfriend had moved out and he said he's been doing drugs. He's been taking much too much. And he said, Judy, you're going to have to help me drive. I said, I don't drive, you know that. Uh, and he said, well, you know, we'll, we'll help each other. It'll be okay. And it ended up that we drove to Vermont to trip, which was maybe five, six hours, with me driving with my left hand from the passenger seat while he had a needle in his arm, a great deal of the time. Impaired as he was, he, he drove better than I did when he, when he could stay awake. Um, the problem was that if he didn't get that coke into him very regularly, he would just fall asleep. It sounded like a pretty tense situation. When I look back on it, uh, <clears throat> I can see that it, that it was uh, very irresponsible behavior. The only thing that really kept me in the car was the fact that he told me from the very beginning that he desperately wanted to get off drugs. But I just wasn't able to stop, you know, because I uh, tried to do it on my own. And, and it, it seemed to have control of you. Yeah, yeah, it did. And um, I was complacent about how I would perform. The first thing that happened was that I started the Mozart and he started the bronze. And we made a very cacophonous sound, both immediately stopped and looked at each other. And that was really the only incident in the concert. It, it went. I mean, he has so much facility that he could play standing on his head. He probably has. I, you know, I'd get through the first piece and had, have no memory slip. Nothing, you know, would go wrong. It was just technically all there. And uh, the second piece, fine, went through the whole program and an encore without any, any technical mishaps. But at this point, you know, I violated my deepest principles by using a drug like cocaine on the day of a concert. And the drug itself obliterated my feelings of guilt. That was July 23rd, 1989. Three days later, hoping to meet his girlfriend, Fodor flew here to Martha's Vineyard. And late at night, after trying to locate a clerk, he says... He broke into a vacant room at the Vineyard Harbor Motel and went to sleep. Skeletal in appearance, Fodor was discovered the next morning by a maid. He then spoke with the manager in an office area, but a phone call interrupted them and Fodor went back to the room. When he didn't come out again, the manager called police. They arrived here the morning of July 27th to arrest him for breaking and entering, and that's when they found his drug paraphernalia, including an aspirin bottle full of cocaine, and several hypodermic syringes. First, I was relieved that finally I, I really would get to a rehab because I wanted to go on my own, but I could not do it. It had a grip on me to such an extent I wasn't able to commit myself. And maybe my ego had a part in it, I don't know, but I really wanted to stop using it. I just couldn't. No matter how hard I tried, I can't understand it. I don't even want to understand it anymore. All I know is that uh, um, I have a higher power that is getting me through this a day at a time, and uh, it's working. Fodor resumed his performance schedule in November after having been sentenced to three years probation on the breaking and entering charge on the condition that he undergo continued drug rehabilitation and submit to random testing. This appearance before a group of school children in Dallas was a voluntary one that combined his music with drug education. And uh, what I'd like to say also is that uh, I know drugs and alcohol are very prevalent and the lure can be very strong. And I just hope that by my example, if, if the opportunity presents itself for you to take drugs, you would think twice about it and realize just that it's not worth it. So that's about it. Nobody ever told you, having grown up as a prodigy, nobody ever told you at a certain point, okay, now you're an adult. You had to figure that out for yourself. Was that a tough thing to do? 
Well, I, I never really knew when the line was drawn. I think I'm, I'm really trying to get in touch with being uh, kind to the child within me now and nurturing that development uh, without any other substance, you know, I mean, any chemical substance, so that uh, the adult can match the emotional development of the child. Are, are you saying that the child within you never has really grown up? Not completely. It didn't, it, I didn't really offer it uh, every opportunity. And uh, I feel convinced that uh, every time I took a drink or used a drug, that development stopped and was put on hold. And, and I can certainly get in touch with um, a lot more emotional depth in these last four months of uh, complete sobriety than I've ever been able to in my life. We were just so proud of him the first night we came here. Uh, we were just choked up after his performance because it just was so beautiful. He just puts his whole being in it. He just loves it more than ever. It's like when one door closes, another opens. And it's, it's living this pain that has given me a link with life and life's terms. You know, and, uh, and being able to really like myself It's been a long time since I've had such an optimistic feeling of anticipation and excitement. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a burning thrill to go out and make more music. Bob, what effect has all this had on his career? Is he getting bookings now? Well, you, there's no question that his career was in a slump even before the arrest and that there is a serious effort ahead of him to uh, rebuild it. Uh, on the other hand, his managers, uh, as of today, say there have been no cancellations as a result of the arrest, and if anything, the number of bookings uh, has increased. Uh, to go on and rebuild the career, it will take some humility. Uh, he says he learned that through rehab. It, off, it, it obviously will take some attention to the pieces that he selects to play, and to some extent to the, the politics of the classical establishment. That's a factor, too. Yeah, now before his arrest, you mentioned there was some decline, but has his discipline held up, that his uh, technique? Well, I think one of the problems was that, he, as he said, he was able to get through a piece without having a disaster, and it even took a disaster to get him into rehab. He couldn't get himself into rehabilitation. He could do it even under the influence. Right? What a snag to hit. Well, we wish him luck coming back. Thank you, Bob. Later. Something very strange is happening off the Florida coast. We're one couple that doesn't fight. You and me. You I, think and me. That, I think that's true. We have disagreements at times, but I don't think in a quarter of a century we've ever had a heated argument. Not no. yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but when you and your partner argue, are you fighting the good fight or are you hurling insults and hate? Psychologists and their researchers have been studying how couples fight and how you fight can make or break your relationship. Over a million couples get divorced every year. Shelves are loaded with books on how to have a better sex life. But John Stossel reports that for a successful relationship, what matters most is not how you make love, but how you make war. You remember the way it was always supposed to be? That wedded bliss the day you marched down the aisle? You had high hopes because you got along so well together. Yet so much of the time, something goes wrong. In this country, there are two and a half million marriages a year. Half of those will end in divorce. What happens to turn this kind of happiness into something like this? They were doing something out here when you came home. And what the hell did you do? You got angry with them right away! For the most disgusting little animal snail piece of slug. Uh, I'm the reason why you're... I never saw him. 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 I never saw
Jason. If it wasn't for me, you'd be dead by now. Now some researchers say it doesn't have to be this way. The good news is that learning how to communicate well, learning how to have a successful marriage, learning how to argue constructively is a skill like any other skill. Like learning how to play golf, learning how to play tennis, learning how to ski, learning how to do calculus. It's a skill and it can be taught. Dr. Howard Markman heads a psychology team at the University of Denver that for nine years has been tracking couples at a kind of combat training for marriage. Here they try to teach people how to fight. To see if you need this kind of training, here's a quiz developed by those psychologists. If two or more of these statements are true for you, they say your relationship may be in trouble. One, I often find my partner doesn't listen to me or understand what I'm trying to say. Two, it's difficult to express feelings of anger or frustration to my partner in a constructive way. Three, peaceful discussions escalate into shouting and hostility. Four, we argue about the same issues over and over again. Now the experts say the arguing itself isn't bad. Every couple argues. The key is learning how to use those arguments to help your relationship. You can look upon marriage as a road in a computer game where bickering couples trip on the same landmine. The experts say there are predictable points of tension. Sex, money, how to raise the children, how to handle relatives, and so on. It's not these differences that destroy a relationship, says Dr. Markman. It's how you handle them. Well, you're such a fan that you, have, you spoil everything. You spoil everything. You know, you're no good. You no goddamn good. When you Several years ago, these couples agreed to argue in front of a camera. It had nothing to do with the Denver research. It was for a documentary on how couples communicate. The couples, when they were about to fight, would call the camera crew and put their argument on hold until the crew arrived. You didn't even say one nice word to them. I was downstairs. The first thing I heard was this goddamn eruption from upstairs. You know what's happening when I walked in this I, goddamn house? They were doing something. They were doing something. I didn't tell them to do it. As is true of many couples, this couple says they had a history of pent-up anger. So even over relatively minor problems, they'd explode. On this day, she didn't like the way he'd criticized the children. You just wiped them out. You know what's happening you when I walk into this house? Thing. You know what's you happening while I walk He's angry about what the children are doing. Everybody is playing their goddamn roles to the hilt. And you just think you can just come goddamn in and I'm door. tired of it. I'm standing here and Mary is pissed at the door because she didn't get her goddamn way. And Edward is standing in the goddamn door with his bemused expression on his face doing nothing. And Robert is sitting here at the table twitching, dangling from the goddamn ceiling. And the dog is in the goddamn kitchen. And I'm supposed to walk in this house and feel happy about what a loving family it is. Today, four years later, Ernie Isaacs and Elvin Blair remain friends, but they split up a year after that argument. Can that kind of breakup be prevented? Dr. Markman says yes if a couple learns how to argue constructively. Couples are able to negotiate the uh, pitfalls, the landmines, the earthquakes of marriage that are out there and are predictable are those couples who go on to have a successful relationship. That's more important than how much they love each other, how sexually attracted they are e with each other. Markman says this because his researchers found that by teaching a hundred couples how to argue better, they could cut the average divorce rate in half. First, the researchers watched hours and hours of couples talking about their problems. They noticed it's usually the women who initiated the argument and the supposedly braver men who became not aggressive, but passive. The men withdrew. Over time, the researchers discovered this was the biggest predictor of divorce. If the men avoid the argument, turn away, become silent, those couples are the ones most likely not to make it. So anyway, I married the SOP. I had it all planned out. First, he'd take over the history department. Then when Daddy retired, he'd take over the whole college, you know? Another bad sign is abusive arguing. This movie, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, is a classic illustration of that. And Daddy thought it was a good idea, too, for a while, until he started watching for a couple of years, getting angrier, until he watched for a couple of years and started thinking that maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all, that maybe... Georgie boy didn't have the stuff. And maybe he didn't have it in him. Stop it, Martha. Like hell I will. 
You see, George didn't have much push. He wasn't particularly aggressive. In fact, he was sort of a flop. A great big fat flop. Stop it, Mother. I hope that was an empty bottle, George. Often when people are very angry, they're saying things that are intended to hurt. So our point is, when both people are yelling and screaming and getting it out at the same time, that's destructive. So how do they teach couples to argue constructively? What we're really pressing couples to do in stage one there is to really make an attempt to express what's going on to the best of their ability. At the University of Denver, they have it down to a five-session course. These couples will be taught to schedule arguments, to say, dear, there's something I need to talk about. Is now a good time? Don't let things fester. You're mad, say it. That's very important. That's one of the ground rules we teach. But to make sure the other person is ready to hear what you have to say. The relationship would benefit if we, if I would be able to do that more often. The couples will be asked to argue in front of an instructor who will tell them if they're doing it right. Now, most couples didn't want to fight on television, so I volunteered. Sometimes. Sometimes I need you just to take the baby. Why take the baby sometimes? Not nearly often enough. I mean, come on. I have... I can't already. breastfeed I have... the baby. Instructor Susan Blumberg played the role of the wife. Beforehand, she'd actually phoned my wife to learn the issues that set me off. That all I can do is go on and on and tell you all those things. And because you know, this drives me crazy. I don't want to spend my life arguing like this. Well, then talk to me at a time when we don't have to argue. Bring it up your I time. reverted to type. I, I did the destructive thing most men do. I clicked off. I'll try to be more... Okay, what, what, what else? When confronted, I felt threatened. I basically just didn't want to talk about it. I'd turn away or say something like this. Okay, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want me to do. I want you to talk to me. It's not then she you... evaluated our fight. Um, some of the more negative things that were happening were primarily that neither of us were listening to each other. You know, we were getting into this kind of standoff position where I was saying, I want this, I want this, I want that this. That way, the discussion became a contest. I would have been the winner, you know, if you gave in to me in a certain way. You would have been the winner if I shut up. On the other hand, she surprised me by saying I did some things right. Some of the positive things that were happening is we did a pretty good job of taking turns. We didn't do too much yelling at the same time. And even though I did the male turn away, at least I didn't do the worst thing, which is to turn away and shut up altogether. The point is we kept coming back to each other. We kept trying again, even though we weren't getting anywhere. And that Does this training really work? Well, we met two couples who say it did for them. Okay, I'll be the yellow guy. Bob Leggy and Janet Ludwig are teachers who live with their two sons, six-year-old Brad and four-year-old Darren. They took the course nine years ago, right before getting married. Since then, they've come back once a year for follow-up interviews. <laughs> Cass and John Patterson were married just over a year ago. Cass's mother paid for the training as an engagement gift because she thought learning how to argue might preserve their happiness. This man's work and woman's work. <laughs> Today, they live in a small house in Denver. John owns a restaurant. Cass is a legal secretary. Both couples say that since the training, they still argue. But now that they know they can confront each other and survive the conflict, the arguing has made their marriages stronger. What do you typically argue about that would, in the past, blow up? In-laws, holidays, money, social life, you name it, all the normal things. You feel better afterwards. You feel a, a difference from before you took the course. I don't have to win all the time. I used to think I have to win all the time. But now there's definite satisfaction in knowing that I got my point across. John's a different person than I am. I'm going to allow him as his opinion, mine, mine, and that's just fine. So I can walk away from an argument now not feeling like I had to win it. But you took away something else from Right. Uh, I've become a better listener, definitely. I was the person that always would argue and the other person I would listen to. And while they were arguing, I was thinking of my rebuttal. So I've changed 360 degrees. I sit there and listen. For somebody who, have, who has spent the hugest part of her life avoiding conflict of any kind at all, the one best part about this course is that it's taught me that I can at least argue, that I can jump into an argument and not be afraid. 
that I'm going to get in over my head or that this is the end of the relationship or whatever used to go through my head. At least now I'm willing to argue. <laughs> I think a lot of men would say, it's not good if my wife argues more. But you're, you're glad she does? I think uh, men nowadays know that if they want a relationship to last and if you're going to make it happen, um, you're going to have to work these things out and it's going to have to be on a somewhat equal basis. And uh, you have to recognize that as a strength rather than as a weakness. Now, to learn what they've learned, you'd have to take the course. But since most of you won't be able to do that, here's some of the basic advice. First, express your anger. Don't hold it in until you're so mad you can't talk constructively. Second, schedule a time to talk, perhaps even once a week. Third, sit face to face. No distractions. No TV, no music, no children to interrupt. Fourth, one partner speaks, the other just listens, then reverse the role. Now, that doesn't mean that you patiently wait your turn and then pounce on your partner. Before you speak, you're supposed to repeat what she said to make sure everyone agrees that the message is understood. In other words, you should say, okay, now you're angry because I did such and such, right? Only when she says, yes, you understand, do you get to make your point. Finally, the experts say when you make your point, talk about your feelings. Don't start throwing blame, telling your partner what to do. For example, don't say, you're such a slob, can't you clean up? Instead say, I feel hurt when you don't clean up, or I feel frustrated, whatever the emotion is. But get the feelings out first. Work on solutions later. So there it is, a little survival training from the expert. When you start out together, it's hard to believe that you'd need training like that. But remember, to stay together, the experts say what counts most is not how much you love each other now, not how often you have sex or how much money you have. All couples will have problems. What really counts, they say, is how well you can address those problems, vent your feelings, and still stay friends. I can't think of a piece we've done that has more meaning to more people than this. We all argue. And I think it's interesting that, that, that the man usually turns off. I thought that was just my experience because I go on so much. But it, it's I guess it's good that you women bring things up. Otherwise, we, we men would never want to talk about these things. The issues would never get discussed. How did you get people to argue in front of, ca of the camera? The documentary makers ran an ad in the paper asking for couples to volunteer. A hundred couples volunteered. Now, the filmmakers say at first people were nervous, uptight, but once they got into the argument, and you know how passionate you can get fighting with your spouse, they would forget the camera was there and have the real thing. Mm. Very yeah, important. Did. Yeah, remind me never to argue with you now that you know all of it. <laughs> Superb advice, John. That's great. Well, next, I want to share with you a journey of discovery. I recently made... I think anybody who watches us regularly knows of my love for the ocean and my concerns about what is happening to the seas. I've sailed to Tahiti and I've seen pollution in the middle of the Pacific. And I've seen when scuba diving, I've seen it on the ocean floor. My most recent sea adventure took me off the Florida coast. Coral reefs provide some of the most spectacular displays of life on Earth. But like knuckles scraped to the bone, coral reefs have been gouged by ships and anchors chipped away by divers and stained by pollutants. What can be done to make up for the damage? Well, there's an unusual effort underway and we want you to take a look. Brace yourself. It may look and sound like a war on South Florida's coastline. But it's really a battle to save and enhance the ocean floor beneath the surface. The ships going down are creating artificial reefs to attract fish and coral. So far, dozens of vessels sent to the bottom have spawned a new growth industry for scuba diving and deep sea fishing. Ben Moskov is the head of the artificial reef program in Miami. What they do is they speed up the process that Mother Nature started on the natural reefs, and we expedite the process, and it's very efficient. The artificial reefs come in all shapes and sizes. Tugboats that used to ply bays and canals. 
oil rigs that outlived their usefulness, pumping crude. And these contraptions made from plastic called kites. At least the barracudas seemed to like them. We set out from Miami to examine what these ocean builders were doing beneath the surface. Ben Moskov took us to a wreck called the Orion. It's one of over 200 artificial reefs off the South Florida coast. For years, the Orion was a tugboat that worked the Panama Canal. Now it has a second life as a home for fish. Right now, she serves as an area for uh, algaes and sponges and corals. Uh, their growth on the ship has provided a nursery ground for juvenile fish. And there are literally thousands and thousands of small fish at various stages of development. So she is essentially a thriving marine community unit unto itself, independent of what's going on around it on the bottom. The theory behind such reefs is centuries old. Almost any fisherman knows that fish congregate around debris like fallen trees. The Japanese started building primitive artificial reefs from wood as long ago as the 16th century and still design hundreds of reefs today to help their fishing industry. Scientists still aren't exactly certain why fish are attracted to a reef. What I found is that the fish use the reefs as a reference point so that they can navigate. In other cases, the reefs divert strong currents providing a rest stop for the fish. And there's food, the plants and other animals. While some fish use the nooks and crannies of the structure to hide from predators. So the artificial reef is really a combination gasoline station, restaurant and hotel for the fish. How are they working? I found that in most cases, the artificial reefs are working just as well as the natural reefs that man has harmed. I think it's only fitting that when Humans have caused damage to natural reefs, which it takes nature a long time to build, that it's proper that we make amends. Here in Fort Lauderdale, we watched the beginning of the process for building an artificial reef. This ship, a retired Coast Guard cutter called the Cape Gull, is one of the next victims for the reef program. What all is involved in getting a ship like this ready to become part of an artificial reef? It's a lot of work that goes into it. One of the main things we have to do is take off anything that floats, any debris, any paper, any wood, any trash that has collected on the ships over the years. Um, Steve second, Somerville heads the reef program in Fort Lauderdale. The hardest task that we have is removing the oil off of it. The, um, all the diesel oil, the lubricating oil, the bilges have to be pumped clean so that when we do sink the vessel, it's environmentally safe. What we're creating essentially is an underwater park that uh, will be down for hundreds of years, that requires no maintenance. Nobody has to paint the fences or pave the, um, pave the parking lots. Um, and after years and years, they'll still be creating these recreational benefits. Those parks are attracting a lot of people, like the day fishermen who go out and try their luck. And scuba divers have flooded the South Florida waters to dive the artificial reefs that line the coast. Neil Watson, a famous scuba diver who has set a number of diving records, took us to one of the most unusual artificial reefs just outside Fort Lauderdale. It's called the Tenneco Towers. These are abandoned oil rigs that were sunk to create an artificial habitat. More than a hundred different species of fish are attracted to artificial reefs. Some, such as tuna and mackerel, like high standing structures. Other fish, like grouper, prefer low standing reefs with lots of holes and narrow openings. There are problems looming on the horizon, though, for artificial reef programs, again because of pollution. There is a concern that, that uh, everybody figures they can come out and dump their refrigerators and tires and trash and, and, and now you have chemical waste and pollutants that, that we're obviously very, very concerned with. Remember the kites? That's the new fad in fads, or fish aggregating devices as they're known in the trade. For just over a hundred bucks, any fisherman can buy the plastic rig and create his own little fishing reef. That compares with a price tag of more than $20,000 for your average wreck and a million dollars for the oil rig. Scientists argue that these plastic devices, which are not permanently anchored, can attract particular types of fish, 
and researchers can more easily study the impact of the reefs in expanding the fish population. The fads we dropped off near Fort Lauderdale worked in only a few days. We went to Miami to watch the last voyage of a New York City tugboat, the final stage of man's involvement in building an artificial reef. Renamed the Rio Miami, the tug had lost an engine and could not be repaired inexpensively. So the reef builders here paid $18,000 to make it a home for fish. Welders worked through the night to open holes throughout the ship so that divers could escape if they ran into trouble. Then the Coast Guard made certain that the ship passed ecological muster so that the tug would not cause any environmental damage to the ocean when it went down. It looks like the only thing that needs to be done up here is the deck swept. At daybreak, the Dade County Bomb Squad took over, laying 200 pounds of dynamite in the ship's hull. The explosives were covered with sandbags to force the blast downward and keep the ship upright so it didn't tip over. When we left the dock, it seemed appropriate that clouds hung heavily over the bay. In a sense, it was a funeral. But as the Rio Miami headed for its final destination, it was also a sort of rebirth for the disabled tug. Just over three miles off the Miami coastline, the tug was towed into position. This is a radio-controlled detonator, and I must admit that when the reef builders asked me to blow up this ship, I had mixed feelings about it. I'm fond of ships of all kinds, and I've sailed them in many parts of the world. But then I realized that once a ship's life is over on the surface, it could start a new life on the bottom, providing a way station and a feeding place for fish and a recreation site for humans. So. It took only seconds for the Rio Miami to go down. Less than 24 hours later, I went down to the tug, some 65 feet under the water. The sinking had been a success. Only a few holes from the blast, like this one, scarred the hull. And already some barracuda were getting accustomed to their new home. The galley inside the ship won't be much help for the fish, but this tug will provide enough food in just a few months. Transform the ship into a new breeding station for a wide variety of fish and coral. And man will have created something lasting for fishermen, for scuba divers, and the fish. An artificial reef, which in just a short time will become a real one. That's interesting. But, you know, you talked about, and we saw a barracuda. Aunt, I mean, is that safe? They're pretty predictable, really. I think there are two-legged barracuda on land that are less predictable, really. They're, they'll let you alone if you let them alone. You know, when I looked at this, I thought, there you go again. You know, I, I, we worry about you. Is there any danger down there? I think not, really. That, I mean, I don't that, want to work here alone. That is a very <laughs> safe activity if it's done right. You know, it really is. A, it, I mean, it, it looks like more danger than it is because if there was a 50 feet above me there there was a emergency tank with mouthpieces dangling there would be the easiest thing in the world to get air if you if you ran out with your own tank it was it was a uh, and some safe sport and a lovely thing to do and i, I think the artificial reefs are doing something they're important that's very true well when we come back we're going to talk about the drug war and the shootout today that took a major drug kingpin should the president go